welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Selection, Use, Care, and Maintenance of FRAR Clothing. I'm Ed Rakowski, Editor-in-Chief of The Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all listeners for attending today's event, and especially Bulwark Protective Apparel for sponsoring this webinar. Our presenter today is Derek Fang. Uh, Derek should be familiar to many of you by now from previous Synergist webinars. He's been involved with the flame-resistant clothing industry in a variety of roles for over 20 years. In his current position as a technical training manager, Derek has developed over 40 hours of training curriculum for Bulwark University. These training efforts cover all aspects of FR clothing, helping companies design and implement an FR clothing program and comply with the OSHA standard for training requirements for PPE. And Derek, I'll turn it over to you. Ed, thank you again for the kind introduction, and good morning and or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're listening to us today, and thank you for taking time out of your day to spend with us, and I want to thank AIHA for the opportunity. So let's get started. Let's get the, the attorneys taken care of real quick. This will be one of the few slides that I will read uh, customers of Bulwark Protective Apparel are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard risk assessments to identify safety hazards in their work environment. Customers of Bulwark Protective Apparel are solely responsible for selecting appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly in conjunction with the appropriate gloves and footwear. Because working conditions and other factors may vary, Bulwark Protective Apparel does not make any representation that these garments of protective gear will protect wearers from injury. Okay, that stuff out of the way. Let's get into the, the meat and potatoes of it. So demystifying the selection, use, care, and maintenance of FR and AR clothing. Well, let's take care of the title, FR and AR. FR is flame resistant, AR is arc rated. What's the difference? All arc-rated clothing, by definition, has to start out being flame-resistant. So it has to be flame-resistant first before it can take on the additional testing to have an arc rating. By default, not all flame-resistant clothing is arc-rated. So hopefully there's one cleared up right away. We work routinely in inherently dangerous environments. Secondary protective apparel is what we build and this is where it's implemented in areas where you can have electric arc flash hazards, general industry electricians, and also our utilities. Flash fire hazards, we see that in our refineries and our oil and gas exploration. Molten metal splash, for us and what we do, it's primarily steel and aluminum. There are other white metals that we can protect against, but those usually take a cocktail of different fabrics in order to achieve that because white metals are nasty. And then obviously combustible dust with the explosive and the chain reaction explosion from that flash fire that can uh, come out of that event. That's kind of the environment our stuff protects folks against. So even though all these thermal hazards may be different, they're different in different industries, the basic selection, use, care, and maintenance is shared across all FRAR applications, and that's what we're going to talk about today, the common areas that they share. We'll first talk about regulations. What does the law say? And then how do we partner with our standards in order to comply with the law? And if there's areas where the standard doesn't really tell us a whole lot, and there's obviously there's not a regulation really there to help us, we'll look at some best practices. FR and AR clothing has been around for a long time. Companies have been doing this for a long time. So there are some best practices out there uh, that can help us in some of those areas where there's not absolutes. So first and foremost, Who's responsible for employee safety? Well, the employer is. You can paraphrase the general duty clause here, but the most basic uh, contract I enter into with my employer is you will not hurt, maim, or kill me on the job. So that being said, our employers then have to do their hazard analysis, hazard assessment, and determine what PPE is needed in order to protect me. So the law says you must protect your people in the most general terms, doesn't give you a lot of the how-to. 
So where do we as safety professionals go to for our how-to? What is our on game day, what is our playbook? Those are our standards. Whether it's an NFPA standard, an ASTM standard, an ANSI standard, all those give us guidance into complying with ultimately protecting our people. So let's look at uh, those big industries that we talked about. Our oil and gas, our refineries, our, and our chemicals where we have flash fire hazards, we have some pretty good standards, some real good go-to playbooks, NFPA 2112 and NFPA 2113. What's the relationship? NFPA 2112 is for us, the manufacturers, on how to build clothing that will protect people against thermal events caused through diffuse fuels such as dust, gas, and ignitable vapors. That's what we're there to protect folks against. So we build it to that standard, NFPA 2112. NFPA 2113, the sister document, is for the end user. That's their playbook. That's how to properly select, use, care, and maintain flame-resistant garments in that hazard. So pretty cool, pretty well-written standard, some good playbooks there. In our general industry, we also have an excellent standard, NFPA 7E, working in and around energized electrical equipment. So that book primarily is written for electricians so they don't what? So they don't get electrocuted. So they don't have, so they minimize exposure to shock. They're not in and around energized equipment. It talks a lot about turning it off. It talks a lot about doing their hazard assessment, doing their engineering study, and really communicating to their electrical folks what kind of hazards they're up against. For the PPE side of it, for the clothing side of it, there's a lot of language in there, but if you break it down to the very basics, have more arc rating in your clothing than you do coming the incident energy coming out of the equipment. So what does that mean? If I do my engineering study and I know the incident energy out of a particular piece of equipment is X, I want to be wearing X plus 1. What can that look like? If I do my study and I do plug in all the numbers and I do my calculation, at the end it says the incident energy is 5.8 calories per centimeter squared. Calories per centimeter squared is just a measurement of heat. That's how much heat is projected to come out of that box if it falls. So if that equipment fails, if that equipment does not do what it's supposed to do and it has a failure and I'm in front of it, you have just told me, that the amount of heat coming out there is 5.6 calories per centimeter squared, how much should I be wearing? More than 5.6 calories and you're going to protect yourself. Plus all the other additional PPE, hard hat, face shield, rubbers, leathers, balaclava, insulated tools, etc. But that's what that tells us uh, when it comes to 7E. In our utility side of the electrical spectrum, they have a law. 1910-269. 1910-269 in 2014 said, hey, employers, you must protect your people who are exposed to arc, flash, and fires. Well, how do we do that? They must ensure that their employees have more arc rating in their clothing, sounds very similar to 7E, than a reasonable estimate of the incident energy that they could be exposed to. Obviously, our electrical grids can be massive in certain services er service areas. It's very hard to have an absolute spot-on calculation for every single piece of equipment. But it says if you run one of these calculating methods, and that's a reasonable estimate to the incident energy that they're up against, protect them to that on the outermost layer. And we'll talk about what that means uh, shortly. So where do we start looking to marrying up our hazards with our PPE? Well, a good place to start is labels. 
labels are kind of like the resume, the pedigree of that garment, and understanding what these labels are, are trying to communicate to you. And if anybody in the audience has worn flame-resistant arc-rated clothing, you know there's a lot of labels in those garments. Why? We're required to communicate a lot of information to you and also have a lot of information there because we have to be able to track these. In the, in the unfortunate incident where something bad happens and these garments are involved in an incident, you have to be able to track them. You have to be able to know where they were made, when they were made, what they were made from, so then you can go back to the roll of fabric and all the test data that was done on that fabric, and you have an idea, a chain of custody, on what happened to that shirt, pant, or coverall that was in that incident from the construction side of it. So all that information has to be on there. We have to tell you what it's protecting to. Does it have an ATPV or an E sub BT, which is an ARC rating, so it can be used in and around energized equipment and ARC flash hazards? And when we get into our 2112 piece, what does it tell you about flash fire? So that's what those labels are there to help you understand. And they have to be done a certain way in order to be compliant with the standards. For our 2112 folks, flash fire, different hazard, different sets of communication, different sets of labeling. You'll see here an example of the label, a little bit different than the one you saw before. It has its third-party verification that the garment was indeed built to the standard, and it also has some similar accountability in that label to help you understand where it was made, when it was made, country of manufacturing, etc. So again, that chain of custody, if something goes wrong, can we trace it back to and get all the data? Because we're required to hold on to that data for 10 years. Now, are labels foolproof? Absolutely not. Can labels be misrepresenting? They absolutely can. Can they be flat out wrong? Certainly. On your screen now, you should be looking at a label that came in from offshore. The independent third party logo is clearly displayed. That independent third party has never heard of this company, nor have they uh, done any work in certifying these garments to be compliant to the, hat, to the standard that they are indicating. The other thing at the top, and we kind of gave away uh, with the early here, is I'm not exactly sure, folks, what flam is. As long as it's resistant to it, I guess that's good, but is that really communicating to me or giving me a good feeling that this garment's going to be able to do what it needs to do? So again, they're not perfect, it's just a place to start, but knowing what they should say, knowing how to research that independent third-party verification and confirm what that label is saying, those are good things to know. So training, we always talk in and around training. We train and should be training on everything, especially when it comes into PPE. 1910, 132, our law says that we have to provide training. We have to document training. We have to tell our employees a lot of stuff in and around PPE. For example, when your PPE is necessary. What PPE is necessary for the hazard? It's particular to clothing, how to properly don and doff, adjust and wear PPE. That's our fancy way of saying putting it on and taking it off. And then if there's areas of concern when you're donning and doffing, if you have static concerns, if you have to go into separate rooms, if you have to separate this and that, that all is falls in line with your PPE training. The biggest thing that we have to talk to is what the limitations of this PPE is. A seven ounce shirt and a 12 ounce pair of pants does not make you impervious to injury does not make you Superman, does not make you bulletproof, and you definitely can't go running into burning buildings and saving babies. This stuff is designed for escapability. It's designed to mitigate injury, not eliminate injury. You can and will be hurt even wearing this stuff properly. How badly hurt you are depends on how you're wearing it, what conditions it's in, and we'll get to that stuff shortly. 
That's why the proper care and maintenance and training you on how to do that is key. This is a life-saving piece of equipment. This is not a shirt, pant, or coverall. Start thinking about this as you would your fall harness. When I am dangling 60 feet up in the air at the end of my lanyard, do I want to be in the cheapest built made fall harness I possibly can be, or I don't want to be in the world's best? Well, again, there's no atheists in foxholes, and there's definitely no people believing in cheap PPE when their life is depending on it. So when you start looking at properly caring for and maintaining this stuff, start looking at it as a life-saving piece of equipment. And then lastly, obviously, each employee will demonstrate that they understand, will document all that, and we'll have our uh, standard operating procedures starting to roll into place. Implementation is key. I can buy you the best. I can train you all day long. And if you still refuse to implement it properly, it will not do what it needs to do when it needs to do it. As I said earlier, up until you need this for what our industry builds it for, and believe me, we build it to protect you against thermal energy, hoping you never have to use it for what I've built it for. But if you need it, it has to be worn correctly, in good repair, and everything going to maximize how you come out of that thermal event. So in all our hazards, going from oil and gas through electrical, etc., we talk about how to properly implement this stuff. And in fact, all the posters that you see here can be obtained uh, free of charge to communicate to your end users on rolling up sleeves is bad, untucked, tying coveralls around your waist, putting duct tape on, on the ankles. What you wear underneath is consistent across all our standards and our laws. Make sure that it does not melt, drip, and add to the injury. What does that leave you? Natural fibers. That's things like cotton, wool, and silk. We go into our general industry, 70E. You'll see language in how to properly wear this. There is no gray area on how to properly wear flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. If it's a shirt and pant ensemble, it's tucked in, sleeves rolled down, buttoned up. If it's a coverall, it is zipped up, sleeves rolled down, and secured. And again, it talks about undergarments having, if they're not going to be flame resistant, make sure that it will not melt, drip, and add to the injury, leaving you cotton, silk, and wool. So you're starting to see some commonality across those two hazards. Then, uh, then we get into our, our electric utility folks, and the law tells us in 1910-269, and also on the construction side, 1926-960, that they're aligned into arc rating equal to or greater than as the outermost layer. It also has a standard. Now, unfortunately, it's not as clear as 2113 and 70E, but it says clothing should cover potentially exposed areas as completely as practical. This should include proper interfacing of related items. Proper interfacing, ladies and gentlemen, of a shirt and pant is with the shirt tucked into the pant. You heard about layering across all our standards and our regulations. One of the things that you, you heard about is it can't melt, drip, and add to the injury. Well, you default most commonly to 100% cotton. Here's my challenge when I talk to my folks in the field. When you look at your team, when you look at your employees and you see that little white, let's just say white cotton t-shirt, just use generic. You see that little white V at the neckline. Are you 100% confident each and every single time that that's 100% cotton? Could it be 50-50? Could it be 60-40? Could it be 70-30? Pick your ratio. Could there be a meltable in there? Because that meltable in that environment will melt, drip, and add to the injury. So it shouldn't be there. All the standards tell you that. How are you sure? Unless you have someone who's going to sign up as the underwear police, you don't really know. So utilizing arc-rated flame-resistant base layers can remove that problem. All the manufacturers 
will have an indication at the neckline so you can easily look down the row of your employees and see if they're wearing their approved base layers. The other thing is, is you pick up additional protection. For our flash fire environment, you're just more protected. You have more FR and you have no multiples, nothing ignitable underneath. You've increased your protection level. You've gone from good, better to best. In our electrical world, you're, you're going to be more protective. How much more protective? You don't know until you test it. And you also don't know until you implement long sleeves instead of short sleeves. And we'll talk about that shortly. It is real. It happens more often than not. We make a mistake with our undergarments, and we will carry that mistake forever. This young electrician's outer layer worked perfectly. In an arc flash, his outer layer didn't break open. In the arc flash, all that radiant heat, all that thermal energy passed through the outer layer, and when it hit his fully synthetic 3.5-ounce performance fiber, which should have been kept in a gym and not on the job, instantaneously liquefied, and then was driven into his skin at 2,200 square foot-pounds of concussive force generated by that arc flash. He spent almost 30 days in a burn unit having plastic deburred out of him, and those are the scars that he carries forever for that mistake. It is real. That's why every standard talks about what you wear underneath being extremely important. How protected can you be? It's up to the getting it tested for our electric hazards. How much more protection do you have? You don't know until you get it tested as worn. Our company and other manufacturers have done a lot of the homework for you. We can't obviously get every combination, but there's a good chance if you're wearing like materials, they'll be able to tell you what the protection is. If you're mixing manufacturers, probably not as easy, but there are some resources out there where there's been a lot of work done that you might be able to find it without having to go test it yourself. The bottom line is if you can't find it and you're still using it, you probably want to go get it tested. Now, remember when I said layering of FR arc-rated fabrics is always more protective, in many cases, that is true. How much more protective, we don't know till we test it. The other thing you've got to remember, in our flash fire world, having two layers of FR, whether it's short sleeve or long sleeve, is just better. We don't test that. There's not a, there's not a how much better than uh, component to it, but we do know it's just better. Two layers are going to be better than, than one layer when it comes to a flash fire hazard. In our arc flash world, where break open is much more real than flash, uh, also, uh, when you look at the amount of energies, even though shorter in duration, greater amount of energy, you want to know, hey, in a short sleeve version, my torso and my upper arms are going to be more protected. In the long sleeve version, you can now take advantage of a system. If I test these two layers together, and let's say the outer layer is six calories of protection, and this base layer here is six calories of protection, I might have 24 calories of protection when I test it together. That is awesome. I now know that my upper half is pretended to 24. Now, how much of a system can I work on? It all depends on the weakest spot in our system. And here, if I had a shirt over top of this long sleeve, then my pants would be the weakest system. So if the pants are 12 and my upper layer is 24, guess what I can work on? 12. If uh, my hard hat, my face shield, for some strange reason, is less than 15, which most of them default to 15, I would still be whatever that number is then. If it was only an 8, then I could only do 8. If my face shield is 15 and my pants are 12 and my upper body is 24, what am I working on? 12. And it's not as simple as that, but for discussion purposes here, that's as pretty simple as we can get it today. Correct way to wear coveralls, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on the far right, that is a standard coverall being deployed properly. Sleeves are down. It's zipped up. Collar's laying flat. This particular model in the middle has a mandarin collar, which in some cases adds an additional layer of safety if it's deployed. If you're going into a high-risk area and you wanted to flip that up and button it, it would add additional protection. If it's laying flat and down, 
no additional protection, but that is a feature of that particular coverall. Uh, on the lower left box, you can see here that we're wearing our uh, FR base layer for additional protection. Some of the not do's, we see this coming off a break on the far right all the time, coming out of the lunch room. It's a little hot. It's July. It's 9 degrees and 9% humidity, and I forget to put that upper half back on. I do put the upper half back on, but I don't zip it all the way up, and I roll my sleeves up because things are hot. Again, we see it all the time. And then the other thing, stopping solvents, soils, dirt, greases, everything else from going inside my boots. Well, duct tape is a meltable. Well, you might say that's not going to do me much harm around there, but it's sure going to stop you from getting out of that coverall if you have to in a hurry. Remember, in a flash fire situation, we aggress to safety. We immediately want to get all that hot fabric off us as quickly as possible. Coveralls are designed for what? Escapability. That's a four-way panic zipper on that garment. Anywhere I grab it and pull, it will open. Those are stovepipe legs. Those are very wide. They're designed to be pulled over top of boots. When I put duct tape on there, that's not happening. In our shirt and pant world, well, especially when we're dealing with that, proper deployment of a shirt and pant. Notice it is tucked in. It is rolled down and buttoned, and it's buttoned on up. We did expose the, uh, ideally, I want to go to at least the button prior to the top. I want to go to the second button down. We did open that up to show you that they're wearing their uh, flame-resistant arc-rated base layer there for additional protection. And if that's long sleeve, in this case, we could have a systems approach to protection and have much more than that outer uh, layers providing in and of itself. So that's how we're properly deployed there. Unfortunately, this is what I see when I'm in the field and my colleagues see when I'm in the field and we're calling on our, our customers and our end users. Still dealing with 90 and 90, we're unbuttoned, we're rolled up. Oh, we buttoned it up, but I'm just going to throw my gauntlets and my rubbers on. I don't need to have that. They're doing all of my protection, so I'll just roll my sleeves up. Again, we're not deploying protective equipment the way it's going to maximize uh, in that event. One thing to caution on the lower left here, what are we putting on our heads? What are we allowing underneath our hard hats? Be very cautious. Bandanas today, a lot of them aren't 100% cotton. They're 50-50. That's a meltable on our head. Most ball caps are not going to be flame resistant arc rated. They're going to be a meltable on our head. In the cold conditions, stocking caps, uh, watch caps, balaclavas, make sure that they have flame-resistant properties at the very least. Better yet, let's make sure they're arc rated. That heat will get up underneath that hard hat. It will melt whatever it can melt. So be cautious that you're not compromising your program by what you're putting on your head. Real brief, in this picture here, we have two items. On the right, as you're looking at the screen, I have a legacy sticker. On the left, we have failure to, and if this was a classroom situation, I'd ask you all, tell me what they failed to do. Because they had their PPE. You can see mid-arm where he rolled up his arc-rated shirt. You can see that, uh, well, in this case, you wouldn't see he had his rubbers and his leathers on. He failed to verify. He turned off the MCC that he thought was at the box, turned it off came back to work on it, failed to verify, and when he took all his PPE off because he was working de-energized, when he put the screwdriver inside that bucket, it arced. That is a career-ending injury. That is second and third degree burns on that hand. That hand will not turn a screwdriver again. In a blink of an eye, that career was lost. On the right here, we have a legacy sticker. This dons the hard hat of a utility in Southern California to remind all their electricians to always tuck them in, button them up, and roll them down. Uh, I'll be real brief with this story. The bottom line was when they worked de-energized, they were allowed to have their shirts untucked, unbuttoned, and sleeves rolled up. Uh, surface level switching gear, thought it was de-energized, came in contact with the lower energized half, the corresponding arc flash, basically vaporized his flame-resistant arc-rated clothing because... The only thing that was left is where it was double layered. The placket, the collar, uh, in and around the, the shoulder line, and the cuffs where they're rolled up. 
because it wasn't deployed properly. It couldn't resist the energy properly. It immediately ignited his cotton, 100% cotton company t-shirt underneath. 56 years old, six months from retirement, ended up being a fatality on the operating table because his PPE was not deployed properly. You always treat it as energized until you verify that it's not energized. Getting into caring and maintaining this stuff and protecting that investment. Uh, over the next few slides, I'm going to give you some pointers. Bottom line is good quality FR from top manufacturers today, it's very, very difficult to mess it up. You can home launder it. You can have an industrial launderer take care of it. If you're in and around contaminants, you don't want your people taken home. If you want to have a single source of, of laundering and taking care of, if logistics makes sense, you can have an IL. If your people are contracted all over the board, like to take their stuff home, no serious concerns with doing it, they can equally just wash them uh, fine at home. Really hard to mess up today's stuff. Now, what do the standards tell you? The standards tell you, follow the manufacturer's instructions. Okay, let's do that. The manufacturers, we tell you on one of those labels, right down there, how to take care of this stuff. Relatively simple. Uh, wash them inside out. That's for color, color fastness. Tumble dry. Avoid bleach and starches. No fabric softeners. No products containing hydrogen peroxide, etc. Why? Hydrogen peroxide, peroxide, excuse me, and chlorine are going to weaken your fibers. Your fibers are what protect you. The integrity of those and how much energy they can withstand, you don't want to be weakening them. Uh, starches can mask your FR properties. They can allow it to take longer than what it needs to do because it's in there mucking up the chain reaction that needs to happen in order to char to protect you. Uh, so those are a couple things right there. If you don't want to read those, you can download from all the manufacturers their PDFs on how to take care of this stuff. Uh, we can get you magnets you can throw on your home laundry. Most of the top ILs and the independent ILs today have been audited in order to take care of uh, flame-resistant clothing. If you have an industrial laundry that you want to know if they've went through the audit process, ask them. If they haven't, let's get them audited. Uh, let's get them on the program so that they're taking care of that stuff per the, how they should. Again, nothing here in the standards. You're not going to find it in the standards. So what are the best practices? We talked about these. No bleach or, uh, bleaches or peroxide. Don't use any additives that can build up over time. Uh, wash your FRAR garment separately. Why? One, you don't want to be introducing any contaminants into your home laundry. And secondly, you don't want to be taking any non-FR fibers onto your FR clothing. Use liquid detergents for best. Avoid the hot, hottest temperatures because uh, that's going to impact things like shrinkage. That's going to uh, impact things like even stiffness and that. So low temperatures if you can. Uh, tough stains and that, you can use stain removers. Not a problem. Just don't use uh, kind of cookie things. I've heard people using Coca-Cola in there. I've heard people using things like borax and, and, and other stuff. So just stick with the basics. If you do have tough stains, you can go get them dry cleaned if necessary. Uh, like I said, tumble dry on low, hang dry them is fine. The big thing is if it smells like fuel, continually rewash them until it doesn't smell like fuel. Across the board here, real simple, the one in the middle, and this just happens to be an example of it. We're not endorsing this particular manufacturer or another, but just simple liquid detergent works best over time. Other things, when you're putting stuff on there, we're, uh, believe it or not, I know it's freezing cold in some parts of the world right now, but we are going to eventually get into mosquito and tick season. Be very, very cautious. Anything can tearing DEET. DEET is an accelerant both in the dry form and the wet form. You are spraying fuel on top of your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. So what are your options? Permethrin-based uh, insect repellents are fine to put on clothing. Um, do a little bit of homework. There are some out there that have done uh, work in and around, especially Arc Flash. Talk to the manufacturers, ask them, tell them, hey, we're looking to use this. What are your thoughts? And get some feedback. Uh, the DEET people tell you to just spray it on your undergarments and your skin underneath, 
and then uh, put your arc rated FR clothing over top. Again, just options, but don't put deep products on your flame resistant arc rated clothing. When it comes to soiled garments, very important to understand stains in and of themselves do not mean you have compromised the FR properties. Staining does not compromise the FR properties. Staining concerns us because it may be evidence of fuel. If it smells like fuel, it's still fuel. Yes, the old college sniff test. If you sniff your garment and it smells like accelerant, guess what it is? It's an accelerant. Wash it until that smell is gone or get a new garment. Working in and around the day, if I'm on the left here and that secondary accelerant, get me out of harm's way. That is way too much fuel on that garment. Those flame-resistant arc-rated properties will not do what they need to do to protect you with that much secondary accelerant on that garment. If that's just a stain after laundering and it doesn't smell like fuel anymore, your FRAR properties are not compromised. If through the workday we look like we do on the right, that may be a field I may be very comfortable working through my day with a little bit of secondary acceler on me. I'm going to get a hot spot. I'm going to pat those, and we're going to be good to go. Again, can't put that across the board as far as uh, making regular things on things like that. It's just going to have to be good common sense, and sometimes and it's really hard to regulate common sense sometimes. Repairing or replacing. Uh, Correct fit at all times. If you do get a little bit more weight, a little bit less weight, if your garments have shrunk a little bit, make sure they're not too tight or too loose. Uh, repairing. Can you repair flame-resistant arc-rated clothing? Yes, you can. Do you want to? I don't know about that. Uh, but if you're going to, uh, use like materials. So keep some old shirts, pants, and coveralls. Use those to make patches. Uh, Get yourself online, Google Nomex Aramid Thread. Get yourself a spool of Nomex Aramid Thread because you have to repair with like materials and flame-resistant thread. So what are some things to think about? Thread borne or worn through cannot be repaired. On the lower left here, you have the elbows. You're starting to see the secondary fabric involved in that particular garment. That needs to be replaced. That cannot be repaired. And remember, we talked about that life-saving piece of equipment we're really stressing the ability of that garment to do what it needs to do. Uh, on the far right, we have a tear. It looks like it's on the seam, but that's a pretty long tear. So what's our rule of thumb? Our rule of thumb is about three inches or less on any kind of uh, rip or tear and about the size of a nickel on a hole. So do you want to repair that even though it's on the seam? You're going to have to make a choice on your own, but it does need to be repaired. On the shoulder here, could be three inches or less. You might want to make that repair. It's still on the, the seam as you see it standing there. So as we're getting ready to wrap up here, uh, a couple things to think about, kind of just like a bonus to throw out there. I don't know if you're involved in high-vis vests or rain gear, but Understand this, you've just made a huge investment in your secondary PPE when it comes to clothing for arc flash and flash fire protection. You can be in the thousands of dollars per wear. And if you require them to wear high-vis vests or rain gear in inclement weather, you could be jeopardizing that whole program by having them on in the wrong gear. What do I mean by that? At the end of this, if you have high visibility vests or rain gear, make a quick check. All you have to do is get a hold of a label, and if the label is claiming flame-resistant properties of a vest or rain gear to one standard, meaning it only references one standard, and one of those standards can be 2302, ASTM 6413, or NFPA 701. If that's the only standard reference in that label, you have the wrong garment. ASTM F2302 has been withdrawn. Why? Because it was being abused in rain gear and vests to give people the false sense of security that garment would, it, would perform in an arc flash or a flash fire. It can claim flame resistancy, but it was never introduced into an arc flash or a flash fire, so you have no idea how it's going to work. 6413, again, preliminary beginning test to launch into additional testing to achieve flame resistance for garments and arc rating for garments. It's a test that's been done on all 
fabrics, but as a standalone, it's not a performance standard. ASTM 6413 rain gear will fail miserably in an arc flash and a flash fire. ASTM 6413 vests that claim to self-extinguish will fail miserably in an arc flash or a flash fire. You will have a big hunk of burning plastic at the very worst sitting on top of your very expensive uh, arc rated gear nullifying its properties. So what gear do you want to look for? ASTM 1891 for arc flashes and rain gear. ASTM 2733 for flash fire in rain gear. Ideally, have both. They're out there, they make them, and that way you don't have to differentiate. But if you're only in electric, make sure it's 1891. If you're only in flash fire, make sure it's 2733. You could jeopardizing that program by having the wrong stuff. The other rule of thumb, if you, if you don't want to take that time, Go to your procurement, go to purchasing, and ask them what they paid for their last high-vis vests and their last rain gear. If their rain gear cost around $100, you got the wrong rain gear. If your vests cost around $25, you got the wrong vests. So real last and wrapping up here, uh, checklist. Always ask for the manufacturer's guarantee in writing on letterhead and signed. Should be easy to do from any top manufacturer. Uh, why is that important? Because it has to be guaranteed to the life of the garment and not to a standard. Guaranteed to meet ASTM 1506, guaranteed to meet NFPA 701, guaranteed to any of the standards that we've referenced today is meaningless. Why? Because they're all based on very, very short wear cycles. They're all very based on very, very short laundry cycles for that testing. They do not equate to real life. So make sure that they're guaranteed beyond what the standards are. Get the test data. If you're in doubt, ask for the test data. It should be easily acquirable. Any garment certifications, verify them. Take a couple of extra mouse clicks, go on to, for example, the UL website and go find your manufacturer's garment that has indeed been certified uh, by that independent third party to be compliant to whatever standard you're looking for. Uh, specify that only compliant, uh, certified compliant garments are on your job site. Uh, periodically police your program. And then the one I skipped, work with proven supply chain partners. Because why? When everything's working perfectly, it's not an issue. If something goes wrong, what resources can your supply chain bring to bear to assist you? Remember, up until you need it, this is just really expensive soil protection. You're walking around in very expensive shirts, pants, and coveralls. But if you need it to do what it's built for, it needs to work. So make sure you're working with proven supply chain partners when it comes to that. As we wrap up here, uh, you'll notice that my email is down there. If you want the PDF handbook that goes with this presentation, just email me, and uh, I'll get that to you. Also, within about a week or so, you'll get a correspondence from us, which will give you access to a white paper uh, on this presentation. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed for some uh, Q&A. And uh, again, thank you, everybody, for taking your time uh, today. Okay, thanks, Derek. Uh, we have about 15 minutes or so for questions. Just a reminder to our audience. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to all panelists. Now, the first question, uh, what is the risk of having a non-certified garment over an appropriately certified garment? For example, non-certified high-vis vest over an NFPA 2112 coverall. Uh, good timing on this one. Um, as you kind of, we tailed into the the conclusion of our webinar there, that's what we were talking about. Uh, there are very inexpensive, high visibility vests that are going to meet the ANSI standards. They're going to get you to that ANSI 107 to where I'm doing what I need for my people to be seen. Unfortunately, you have to go above and beyond that because your hazard assessment says you have an arc flash hazard or a flash fire hazard. So that is now on the outside, so it has to have similar flame-resistant properties to what you're wearing underneath. It can't melt, drip, and add to the injury. The problem is, for just bare minimal, someone that's gained a FR designation by meeting the most minimal standards, and they have not been tested to your hazard, they can fail. And what that failure looks like 
is you'll have ignition of that high-vis vest. That high-vis vest is primarily going to be usually about 100% polyester. That ignition will then cause hot air to rise. That ignition is going to be right in my breathing zone. Also, my breathing apparatus is exposed to hot, high thermal energy, and it's sitting on top of my flame-resistant fabric. The heat is not being stopped from getting out. The heat is still permeating into me because it's stuck to my clothing, so I'm getting first, second, and potentially third-degree burns from this big hunk of plastic that is now burning on top of my flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. So it is essential that you do everything to explore that outermost layer when you're adding it out there. Okay. Uh, James asks, can we revisit what we need to look at on labels to ensure validity of clothing markings? It seemed like an important step covered under one of the initial slides. Let me zip back here, and I'm assuming we're still live on the screen, and we'll be able to get back to that. So this is, is an example of one. So this is one, depending on what the garment has been tested to and what it's been being applied to. Now, many garments today, and by garments, they're made of fabrics. Those fabrics have multi-hazard applications. Uh, you can have a single fabric that has an arc rating. You can also have a single fabric that has been certified to be 2112 compliant. So that same garment can be used in a refinery. It can be used in a utility. It could be used by an electrician in a refinery. So he has arc flash hazard, flash fire hazard. So those labels that are in those garments are communicating to you, the end user, kind of, again, that snapshot, that resume. So as you start to look through that, you're going to see that it has an arc rating. Anytime you see an ATPV or an E sub BT, that's an arc rating. You're going to get the fiber content has to be communicated clearly. This one happens to be 88% cotton, 12% nylon, where it's made who it's made by. You'll see codes in there that allow us to track that, that garment. You'll see this again with the laundry uh, cycles in it. Then on the next page, you'll see a little bit different. You'll see this one has for 2112. The language is a little bit different, but a lot of the common denominators are the same. Manufacturer's name, identification, address, country of manufacture, fiber content. Uh, because there's not a rating system in Flash Fire, uh, what's important here is the logo of the independent certifier to 2112 compliance. Remember, NFPA doesn't certify anything. In this case, UL and other independents are doing the certification that you're compliant to the standard. So they take the fabric. They take all the components that make the fabric. They take everything together. They go through their process, and they deem you to be certified, or they certify you to be compliant to the standards. So that's what the relationship is there. So hopefully that helps. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, Brenetha has a question. She asks, what is the best FRAR clothing for working with cryogenics and flammable gases? Flammable gases, I'll answer that one first because that one falls into my knowledge base. Uh, any flammable gases on your hazard assessment, are you going to determine whether that's going to be an open flame fire or is that going to have a flash fire component to it? Uh, the flash fire component to it would put you into that 2112 category to where you have uh, diffuse fuel such as dust, gas, or vapors of an ignitable liquid. So I'm going to, without further information, I'm going to say that puts you in there for a 2112 compliant garment. The cryogenic piece, uh, that's way outside my prevail. I would not be able to answer that here. Uh, I will do my best to uh, touch base with any of my colleagues and see if I can find you a, a resource to ask that question to also, because that obviously throws another variable in there and we can definitely uh, try to drill down and, and, and get an answer. Okay. Uh, 
Dave says uh, he's conducting work in multiple refineries. There are widely varying requirements for high visibility vests and rainwear. Not all require FR. There's no arc flash hazard, but there's flash fire hazard. Do you have any suggestions on supporting recommendations or supporting recommendations to use FR regardless of lesser facility requirements? It's all going to boil down to a discussion. If, if you have a refinery that requires, and all the refineries that I've ever been in here, for the most part in, in the U.S., and even some of my U.S. facilities overseas, at the very least, their daily wear, their shirts, pants, coveralls, are going to require that they're NFPA 2112 compliant because that's your flash fire hazard. The standard's actually built to industrial flash fires. So the next logical step in discussion would be if that's the outermost layer during nice, sunny, non-rainy days, why does, why does the outermost layer criteria change when it becomes inclement weather? Uh, whether that inclement weather is rain, sleet, snow, whatever, why am I putting something on still in the same hazard that has not been tested to the hazard, meaning I'm putting on non-flame-resistant uh, rain gear or rain gear that has flame-resistant properties that are not necessarily to the hazard. ASTM 2733 for refineries for rain gear. For vests, you have to, in fact, ANSI, if you're going to be ANSI compliant with an FR vest, ANSI's even gone to the length in, in the 2015 version to tell you what five standards that vest must be in order to be claimed to be flame resistant. So if it's a high-vis vest on a refinery, it must be one of five standards, which are going to be ASTM 2733, 1891, 1506, 2112, or 1977. 1977, probably not going to see a lot that because that's your wildland standard. But those other four standards are readily commercially available, you have to be uh, compliant to that standard in order to even designate as FR. So, by default, if you're not, if you're using an ANSI vest that's not to one of those standards, by default, it's non-FR. Why would you be allowed? Because the standards don't allow you to put a non-FR layer on top of an FR layer. So, how are you able to justify that to your team members that hey, you're in a flash fire hazard. Hey, you're protected on sunny days but you're not protected on rainy days, or hey, you're protected when it's, uh, you know, when there's good lighting, but if you're in a low light condition or you have to wear a vest, I'm going to give you something that might ignite, melt, drip, and add to the injury. It doesn't, it doesn't compute. It doesn't uh, pass the eyeball test. So I don't know if that's a way to have a communication or a discussion, but they're definitely uh, sending mixed signals at the very least to their uh, employees. Okay, uh, Caitlin asks, what about pyrophoric liquids or solids? Nasty. Those are bad. Uh, there is, uh, depending on what the exposure is, for example, if it's in a lab type environment, there are uh, flame resistant chemical splash or chemical protection lab coats that are available for that type uh, of hazard. If it's something to where you can't, the hazard is where you're material handling it, where you're moving a lot of it, uh, there are coveralls that have uh, flame resistant and chemical splash uh, protection. And the flame resistance would be primarily the, the ones that we use. It's a Nomex 3A fabric, uh, whether that's in the lab coat or the coverall. That's going to give you that flash fire component of that and then obviously be able to shed some of that off uh, if it does come in contact. So there is, there is the dual components there. But uh, if you need any more detail on that, I have a colleague that's well-versed in lab safety and well-versed in uh, our product line that goes in there. I'd be more than happy to pass that along. Okay, uh, next question, Derek. Can you add can you add ATPV ratings to get an ARC rating? So we spent a short amount of time digressing into layering as additional protection. 
when we spend a lot of time talking about layering, especially in our electrical community, because that's where the cumulative value of those layers really come into play, uh, the answer to the question is no. Uh, there was a time and place where if you were wearing, let's just say for ease of use, let's say my outer layer is eight and my base layer, which is long sleeve, is five. Eight and five is 13. There was a time and place we could say you're at least a 13. Now, when we test it, we know you're going to be more than 13, but if you just want a baseline, if you don't want to deal with the hassles of testing, you just want to know what it is, you could at least add it to get it. That went away, gosh, I'm going to say five years. It was probably closer to seven now uh, where we couldn't categorically say that. Why? Because the marketplace changed primarily. We used to have Nomex, Endura Ultrasoft, Endura, PBI Kevlar, Kermel, and maybe one other. We had about five or six commercially viable fabrics that were being cut and sewn into shirts, pants, and coveralls North America-wide. Well, about seven years ago, there was a massive influx with FR mode acrylics, different FR blends, different combinations of, of all that fun stuff. Well, all those fabrics that were made up of those fibers all have pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses. What we started finding is in some of the combinations, when you took that 5 and you took that 8 and you expected a very minimal of 13, you might have got a 10. You might have got a 12. You weren't every single time exceeding the sum. So we had to say, nope, you can't add them together. You have to go get them tested in order to know what that system will actually do. Now, you'll find the large majority, and especially I can speak to our company, everything that we've ever tested in our product line and any kind of layered has always been greater than the sum. The problem is, is the vast majority of fabrics and that that are in the marketplace today, you just don't know until you get them tested. And that's why the requirement to get them tested is there. Okay, thanks, Derek. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, my thanks to Derek Sang for his presentation, to Bulwark Protective Apparel for sponsoring this webinar, and to all of our participants. We've got a full calendar of webinars in 2019. Uh, our next event is one week from today, February 19th, and it's a new type of webinar called a product demo. Uh, you can read more about it and register at aiha.webvent.tv. Great. Uh, this concludes today's webcast. Thank you very much for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv, and we will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link. Uh, please visit our event calendar while you are there to sign up for future webcasts.